Hello everyone, uh, welcome to week two of Greek for Ministry. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the overview last week. We're going to do a little bit more before we really dive into the Greek language. Um, just as a, I hope, a helpful tool, um, I tried to summarize all of last week's content onto the first page of this sheet. So this will give you kind of a, a quick overview of all the things, at least all of the important kind of reference things that uh, you'll need to know from last week before we jump in to this week. Uh, so, so what is new this week? Well, we're going to add in a few of the things that we didn't talk about last week. Uh, the first of those being prepositions. Um, there are quite a few prepositions in the English language, not quite so many uh, in Greek, you'll be happy to know. However, all of the functionality of uh, English prepositions are still in the Greek ones. They're just all packed into much fewer. Uh, so just to give you some idea, there there are two basic ways that, that prepositions are used in English. The first being positional, and this is the one that you're probably most familiar with if someone were to ask you. So the examples I give here for you here, uh, the woman is on the box that's giving you her position relative to the box, right? And then the turkey is in the cage, once again, the position relative to the cage. The other way that you probably don't think about quite so much is is the conceptual relationship between two nouns. Um, and so, for instance, here uh, the book is about construction. That is, the the word about is a preposition, but it's not telling you where the book is at in relation to construction, but rather that this book contains ideas about construction. And then, likewise, Jesus died for us. Uh, here, for has nothing to do with positionality. It has everything to do with conceptuality. Um, in this case, if you were to kind of uh, broaden the idea to make it more explicit, you might say something like, Jesus died for the sake of us, that is for our sake. Um, so all that is to say prepositions can be extremely versatile. Um, and I've given you quite a list here uh, to look at. My best advice to you is if you come across a word and you write it down uh, in this week's homework as a preposition, uh, Google it. Amazing resource, Google. Uh, and a dictionary will come up and tell you whether or not it is in fact uh, functioning as a preposition. So feel free to use that resource. Um, that's not cheating because I just gave you permission. The second category that we're going to look at this week uh, are adverbs. These are things that you use incorrectly all the time. Uh, well, actually, you probably don't use adverbs incorrectly. You probably use adjectives incorrectly. Um, adverbs are meant to modify verbs to tell you the manner in which you are doing a verb. So, I ran. Well, if I was going to explain to you the manner with w in which I ran, I would say I ran quickly or I ran slowly, depending. Uh, so adverbs in English, uh, almost always, but not always, have the L-Y as the kind of telltale sign that they are, in fact, adverbs. Um, hence my uh, identification tool there. If it ends in an L-Y, it is likely an adverb. Um, just to give you some examples here, the dog ran quickly down the street, the man twirled beautifully through the air, and the turtle marched slowly across the grass. Uh, these should pop out to you fairly easily in the text. There's a few for you right there. Um, the ones that we use uh, incorrectly most often are things like good. Um, how do you feel? I feel good. Well, good's an adjective. Well is in fact an adverb. And that's why when people say you mean you feel well, that's what they're doing is they're correcting your grammar uh, to try to get you to use an adverb there rather than uh, an adjective. Uh, one of the things I always tell my son, he he's three and he likes to watch Thomas uh, and friends. There's a line that they almost always use and they say, Thomas felt terrible. And I always look at him and say, I wonder what terrible feels like, uh, as though it's some object that you can feel. And then I say, what they meant to say was, Thomas felt terribly. And my son looks at me like I'm an idiot. Moving along, uh, conjunctions and particles uh, slash articles. 
this is a, a tricky crowd of words um, that kind of just all get lumped together because they're just these little bits here and there throughout our language. Um, so let's start first with conjunctions. Conjunctions are connecting words, um, most popularly conjunction, junction, what's your function from Schoolhouse Rocks. Um, if you haven't seen that video, you should go watch it on YouTube. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. Um, but there are several kinds of conjunctions, uh, but let's take a look at a few here. Coordinating conjunctions uh, for and nor but or yet so uh, fanboys if you haven't learned that acronym before um, and these are simply ways to kind of tie different ideas together within a sentence I have seen many miracles for instance I saw a paralyzed man stand up in a music hall after saying a prayer uh, so in this case uh, the four is connecting you back to the I have seen many miracles, but it's also linking you to the next bit, which is giving you an instance of which you saw this miracle. Um, the most common, obviously, that we use is and. Correlating conjunctions, uh, these tend to come in pairs, so both and rather than, either or, as, as, such, that, and I give you a few examples here to look at. Um, either you are hot or cold. You'll see a few of those uh, pop up in the homework. The next thing I want to look at are particles slash articles. Um, the most important of this uh, of this category are the articles. These are things we do not think about at all, um, but they are extremely important in our language, and that is the indefinite and the definite article. Now, uh, the indefinite article has two different forms in English, either an A, the letter A by itself, or A-N if it's preceding a word with a vowel. So, in this case, there was a man. Is this generic idea that it's just a man. We don't know who this man is, hence it is an indefinite article. Um, if it were an android, then it would be there was an android, right? Because you need that N before the next letter that begins with a vowel. Uh, I don't know if you ever knew that rule, but there you go. Uh, the definite article is the word the. Uh, this tells us that we're referencing a specific uh, known quantity. In other words, uh, the example I give you here, several kings were walking along a path the king sat on the side of the road. Uh, here we are referencing the kings, the several kings that were referenced in the previous sentence. Therefore, it's not just some kings or kings. It is the kings that we are referencing. That's a definite article. Uh, other particles that I didn't add on here that you should be aware of, and I actually mentioned this in a few of the homework discussions, uh, not, no, uh, a lot of those words that are just kind of like negations, those are technically called particles. Um, but we don't need to worry too much about those um, as they won't come up much in the Greek language. Uh, but they will be here and there in English, so I'll point them out when necessary. Now let's add to our previous knowledge. Um, we dealt a little bit with nouns and pronouns, but we didn't do much with uh, demonstrative and relative pronouns. And in fact, someone was asking some questions about those and whose, and as many as, I think, was another question of how do those function. Um, they'll fall into these categories. So first, demonstrative pronouns. So demonstrative pronouns are... Uh, really function like adjectives in the English language and we tend to use them as what's called the near and far. So this and these are uh, near demonstrative adjective or demonstrative pronouns and these and the, or sorry uh, that and those are the far demonstrative pronouns. Um, so for the for example these plums are sour I prefer those apples. Uh, those are both demonstrative pronouns and the reason that I say they function adjectivally uh, is if you look at it there which plums these plums they're joining on almost like an attributive adjective to the noun plums. Um, so they tend to occur that way. Uh, occasionally they'll function substantively, so you'll get uh, these ones are sour, right? That, that would be a substantive use of the demonstrative pronoun. Those occur fairly often. Uh, the, the relative pronouns are another category of speech that we uh, misuse fairly often in the English language. Um, so these are generic pronouns that introduce a relative clause. Uh, that is, 
a clause that tells you a little bit more about a noun in the sentence, but is disconnected from the main verb of the sentence. So I give you an example here. Uh, the girl who jumped over the puddle helped the rest of the children cross without getting wet. So what I've done there is I bracketed off the relative clause because you can see when you abstract that out of the sentence, you still have a complete sentence. The girl helped the rest of the children cross without getting wet. That's a complete sentence with a, with a subject, a verb, an object, and everything. Um, when you throw in the who jumped over the puddle, this gives you an idea of who this girl is, right? That's called a relative clause, and it always begins with a relative pronoun. Um, if it's a person, it's generally who. Uh, if it is an, an inanimate object, as you're about to see in the next example, it's something like which or that. Uh, so uh, the boy lugged the book, which weighed about a thousand pounds, across the parking lot. Once again, the boy lugged the book across the parking lot is the main sentence. The The relative clause is about the book itself, and it's telling you something about it, right? That it weighed a th about a thousand pounds. Um, the next example I give you is to show you what uh, correct usage of the word whom is. Uh, so who is a way of creating a relative clause and the who in that case is functioning as the subject of that relative clause. So if you look at the first example, who jumped over the puddle, who is the subject jumped as the verb of that relative clause. When you create a relative clause uh, where the who is not the subject, you usually have a preposition and you have to use the form whom to show that it is either the direct or indirect object. So in the case that I've given you in the third example, this spirit by whom you have been healed, that's the, the relative uh, clause, and you is the subject of that relative clause, um, and the spirit is by the means by which the action is being done. So this spirit by whom you have been healed is the spirit of God. Those are some basic examples of a relative pronoun. All right, uh, now that we've added on a bit to our pronoun knowledge, we're going to add on to our verbal knowledge because I know you were all thinking, goodness, I've only got 12 tenses. I, I need some more some more to work with, right? Uh, so we're going to add a little bit of nuance uh, to these 12 tenses. So not only are there 12 tenses of verbs in English, but there are also three different voices, um, one of which we should be able to recognize fairly easily because we add a word to it uh, to, make, to make it make any sense. Um, but the other ones can be a little bit tricky. So the the ones I gave you to practice on last week were all active voices. And what I mean by active is that the subject is doing the action of the verb. Okay, uh, So Batman is the subject of the verb in the sentence, Batman threw the batarang at the Joker. Right, So Batman is throwing the batarang. The middle voice is when you are doing the action of the verb to yourself, or I should say the subject is doing the action of the verb to the subject's self. So uh, so here, while he was hypnotized, the man would hit himself in the face whenever someone said cheese. I don't know where I came up with that example. Um, but this is the basic idea that you are inflicting the verbal idea onto yourself. Um, and so hence, it's fairly easy to recognize because there will be a reflexive pronoun, himself, herself, oneself, and so on. The passive uh, is when the subject is being acted upon by the verb. So the example I give you here, the football was kicked 60 yards by the expert punter. So the football is the subject of the verb, but the verb is passive. So the football, while it is the subject, is also being acted upon here. This is just a way of flipping around the, um, the general sentence structure, but it is important. And in fact, will be extremely important in your study of Greek to see when verbs are passive and when they are active. Okay, so that's the subject matter uh, for the week this week. I'm going to give you some space in the homework to explore some of these ideas and actually have you dive into a very particular example of where uh, a verb is functioning passively and it is extremely theologically important, at least uh, from my study and my perspective. 
So I look forward to seeing how you do on the homework um, and you should be getting your graded worksheets back very soon for week one. Thank you all for all your work.